Hello, hello, beautiful people. It is March 1st, and we are thrilled and excited to um, have you join us for this Regulatory Pathway launch event, where, where we'll discuss everything related to digital health regulations over the next 90 minutes. Good morning to individuals joining us from Pacific time. Good afternoon to all the East Coast and Central timers, and then good evening to individuals joining us globally. We are thrilled to have you. Um, and if I can't see your faces, please, drop in the chat your name, what do you do, or what organizations you uh, represent so that we can cater some of our remarks today um, based on who the stakeholders are, who's in the audience. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get us started. Today we are going to discuss about some of the launch resources as a part of digital health regulatory pathways. And before doing that, for individuals who are joining us for the first time and have not heard of DIME, DIME or Digital Medicine Society is a global nonprofit dedicated to advancing ethical, effective, equitable, and safe use of digital medicine to redefine healthcare and improve lives. We launched in May of 2019, almost three years ago, and ever since, we sit on the intersection of two communities of healthcare and technology. We bring in stakeholders, leaders from across the board, be it clinicians, health systems, investors, payers, regulators, ethicists, engineers, on what good looks like as we think about uh, developing, deploying, and integrating technology in clinical care, clinical research, and public health settings. And we do so. Um, and we call ourselves to deliver clinical quality work on a tech timeline. And we do so by three areas. One is by building good science, making sure that we bring in experts together um, to build evidence-based frameworks, resources, and tools that will support development of high quality digital health products. And then once we build that, we try to communicate and educate with the rest of the field to make sure that those resources are available to everyone trying to advance this field. Last but not the least, um, we are as good as our community and we try to collaborate from across the industry because if there's one thing that's clear is we cannot do um, or make progress in this field without a good community. And um, as a part of our partnership with various community members, uh, we have partnered with over 198 leading digital health organizations in 2022, last year. And as of this year, we have um, outnumbered beyond 200 organizations. So today I'm really excited to share with you, um, and I'll take a few minutes to share about the Digital Health Regulatory Pathways Project um, and some of the resources we shared with first housekeeping. Today's session is recorded and will be available on Dan's webinar page within the next 24 to 48 hours. If you have any questions, please drop it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this uh, session and the panel discussion. So how are we gonna use your time today most effectively? We'll start with a few quick opening remarks by the CEO of Dime, Jennifer Goldsack, and then we'll have a keynote address and discussion with Brennan O'Leary, Deputy Director of Digital Center of Excellence around navigating various tools um, for digital health regulations. Next up in session two, we have three panels planned. A first discussing about navigating this complex landscape of digital health regulations. Second is about optimizing regulatory strategy. And third, in terms of how to successfully interact with our regulatory colleagues as you're building the product, not after you've built the product. And then we'll end with a Q&A at the end. So this inception of the project started when um, Dan had conducted a survey in the digital medicine community where we found out that out of our community members, only 25% of the developers actually knew if the products were regulated or and out of those, three out of four actually did not know what's the optimal regulatory pathway um, and how to navigate that. This is true not only for our membership, but also across the industry. There is so much confusion, there's so much uncertainty, and there's so many questions. Questions around should my product be regulated or not? Where can I find the right information? What kind of regulatory pathway may apply to it? How can I classify my product in the US? What are some of the components of regulatory strategy uh, that can inform some of the commercial strategy? So this project, we started with the goal to create some action-oriented tools and resources to essentially support innovators, recognize 
when should they be regulated? What kind of pathway it may make for them? And our objectives are to develop interactive open source public facing regulatory tool that we are excited about to build the world's first navigation tool uh, for innovators to navigate digital health regulatory pathways for uh, various digital health plans. Second was to create supplemental resources that will help accelerate commercial progress of these products as they design a right regulatory strategy that connects to their business strategy. Last but not the least, communicate and make, uh, educate our ecosystem about the value of digital health regulations and earn trust from across the industry. And how we have crafted these resources are in three different buckets. One that helps you to identify your regulatory pathways to help you navigate through various complex um, guidances and the landscape. Second is to build the right regulatory strategy that you can use to optimize and differentiate yourself and your companies and products um, as a part of building high quality, trustworthy digital products. And then last but not the least, how you can successfully interact with regulatory colleagues which is early, often, um, and transparent as you are building the product. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Brendan O'Leary, who will share some keynote address remarks, and then Jen Goldsack for a couple of uh, key keynote panel discussions. Fantastic. So, um, Brendan, uh, I I could introduce you in a way that would make your mum very proud, but it will be much more interesting for you to talk a little bit about your background and expertise, but also you've been part of the Centre since its exception in 2020. So maybe you could go ahead and introduce not only yourself, but also a little bit about the Centre for folks who might not be aware of its broad purpose, actually. Well, sure, and, and thank you. Yeah, I've I've been with FDA for about 14 years now, actually, and have been in a number of roles um, from you know radiology review uh, through in vitro diagnostic policy, um, but always with a focus on software and digital health. And so um, it's it's been a pleasure to work with CDRH on things like the device software functions and mobile medical applications policy back when the iPhone was pretty new, um, and we were all trying to figure out uh, this this growing and, and new space. Um, and then to sort of join the group that would become the Digital Health Center of Excellence about three years ago as the deputy director um, and help launch that and, and now really help continue to drive that forward. I think, you know, the DHCOE is here to make FDA ready um, for this digital future uh, that, that we have in, in healthcare delivery in the United States. Um, you know, over the last few years, there's, there's been a couple of focuses. One focus really is just following through on some of the long-term commitments related to 21st century cures, uh, which was a really important law that passed in 2016 and changed what FDA does and doesn't regulate in, in the space of digital health. Um, and I think in the last couple of months here in September, October, et cetera, you saw us launch our digital health policy navigator, which really helps people understand what's in and what's out. Um, and, and frankly, if you wanna be in, how to be in, and if you wanna be out, how, how to be out uh, for your product, depending on your business strategy. And it's it's been exciting to see more and more companies pursuing those sort of higher impact indications uh, and intended uses that can really benefit Americans um, and coming through the regulatory pathway with good evidence, um, thanks to efforts like those of your organization and others. Uh, and so this fall, really following through on the policy navigator, the CDS guidance, um, you'll see us continue to wrap up uh, some of that sort of work, delivering on those longer term commitments, things like finalizing the um, software guidance uh, for pre-market content. Uh, that's very high on the agenda. Um, and I, I think that's going to be another really in step, important step forward, moving from just sort of what does FDA regulate to how does FDA regulate those products um, that are medical devices uh, that, that come through these pathways. We're really looking to simplify and align that approach to modern software development processes. And I think that the pre-market software guidance when it finalizes is gonna be an important step in that direction. Um, maybe an even bigger step and something I'm really looking forward to is getting the discussion and comment period going on a draft guidance for predetermined change control plans for artificial intelligence and machine learning enabled technologies. Um, this is gonna be a huge shift for the industry. Uh, it's gonna 
enable safe and effective and really importantly rapid innovation in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's something that we've been pushing since 2019. Uh, there were some really important recent developments in the omnibus bill that passed in December that make it much more possible for FDA to deploy this approach broadly. Um, and that's something we're really excited about, being able to bring this not just to the novel technologies that we see through de novo, but also to the technologies that we see through 510K and other regulatory pathways. Um, PCCPs are also going to be something that we see not just for artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, not just for software, but really for all medical devices. And I think that that's exciting as well. We've got our work cut out for us uh, to, to figure that out. And I think it's going to be important for us to continue to engage with um, partnerships like this one, collaborative communities and others to find the right path forward um, for that approach. But we're really excited about the potential for that approach to really make medical device development much, much faster and um, really more patient-centric in the United States. And along those lines, I think right now we're really doing some longer term planning. Uh, we, we are at an inflection point here, and we have an opportunity to transform how healthcare is delivered in the US using digital health technologies. And so I think as we've sort of moved from what does FDA regulate to how is FDA going to regulate, I think now we're also really taking, taking stock in what the goal here is. Um, how do we want to transform healthcare delivery in the United States using technologies like these that are safe and effective and have a strong evidence base? Uh, so lots of exciting work to look forward to here in the coming years. Um, fantastic. Brendan, what a tremendous overview. And I mean, the work rate of you and your team is just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, we, uh, our unofficial tagline here at Dime would be clinical quality work on a tech timeline. And so the work we're releasing today, the corpus of work that this project team were able to build happened in short order. But yet during the course of that, you guys released the, um, just as you mentioned, the policy navigator and multiple draft and final guidances. It's an extraordinary sort of pace of innovation. Um, I love the turn of phrase you use around uh, moving from what are we regulating to how are we regulating? I like that you talked about the importance of collaborating with industry and you've now got pathways to do it. Things like the TAP pilot, for example. Um, for folks on the line from industry, for us here at Dime, I'd be thrilled to have you talk a little bit more around how we can get involved at sort of codifying some of this white space. You can't regulate it until we know what good looks like. Um, how can we do that across industry, government and, um, and the private sector? And I appreciate the way you're framing that. What does what good look like, right? And there's sort of the, the easy traditional FDA answer to that. Um, you know, good looks like strong scientific evidence that something is safe and effective for its intended use. And then I think when you look at programs like the TAP pilot, like the digital health program, and like others, um, it's, it's moving beyond that to good looks like safe and effective uh, for its intended use. And, and also, you know, that's going to be adopted uh, for good reason. And so, you know, if you look at CDRH's vision and mission, it's about patients in the U.S. having access to high quality, safe and effective medical devices. And that's true for digital health, too. Um, access is more than just authorization. Uh, and to the extent that we have this incredible opportunity to work with industry early in the device development process, uh, to bring the right stakeholders together early in that process, to identify the right fit for these technologies, to identify the right evidence for these technologies, not just for regulatory purposes, um, but for all of the downstream purposes. You know, FDA isn't the only organization on the planet uh, that cares about the evidence around medical technologies. We've got a lot of people to convince for very good reason uh, when, when we bring these novel technologies forward. And so I, I'm looking forward to, to seeing how pilots like the TAP pilot and others can help us do a better job of getting things not just over the regulatory line, um, but getting them to patients, uh, getting them to people. And I think that that's really the goal. Um, it's absolutely the goal. And uh, Brendan, I love how you talked to talked about sort of two areas and then coupled them together. So being safe and effective, but also wanting them to get adopted, right? So that comes down to trustworthiness and that is only earned. It's earned through evidence, but it's also earned, just like you said, by thinking about who are the decision makers at every step that actually need to trust that these products are safe and effective for everyone that our industry is here to serve. Um, it's interesting too, if we think about it in the context of this work, work you've done in determining what you need to regulate, work that was done in the policy navigator and work that this project team does, once you understand what the sort of uh, regulatory pathway is for your product, you can also identify those downstream decision makers, right? Are you a wellness product that's going direct to consumer, as we would call it, right? 
well, then there's a narrative there around how you earn that trust. If you're a regulated product, just as you said, right? Well, then it's potential payers. It's those prescribing clinicians who need to trust the product enough as well. Um, and it's, of course, and I hammer this and hammer it, but it's those patients we need to serve. So I think thinking of those downstream players is great for business. It's great for patients. It's great for building trust. But in order to do that effectively, you have to know what regulatory pathway your intended use and your claims sort of put you on. I think you're completely correct. I mean, the reality is that leading medical product developers have always embraced regulatory considerations as fundamental to their business and their business plans and their portfolio strategies. Um, we have a full breadth of regulatory pathways for digital health solutions and the value they can bring digital product manufacturers, clinicians, and most importantly, patients and the people that these products are here to serve is really critical to transforming the healthcare system and enabling the ecosystem in the digital era. So we, we are absolutely working to make this easier at FDA with work like what we've done on the Policy Navigator. And I really love that Dime and others are jumping in with efforts like the one we're talking about today uh, that are so aligned with that. It's really exciting. Fantastic. Um, Brendan, many thanks to you for joining us today. Um, thank you for all of the support that you were able to lend us through the creation of these resources. It's been a pleasure, not just for our Dime team, but for all of our collaborators at the table. You've sort of... Um, illustrated, right? And the thing I torture our team with here at Dime is show, don't tell. I think you've done an exceptional job of that at FDA and at the center in particular of, you know, we are going to show you how open we are to learning together where there are still uncertainties around what good looks like. We will figure that out together. So many thanks, Brendan, for everything you've done. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate your remarks. Um, and as you talk about the drive into the future, this moment of change, we're delighted to uh, have the opportunity to collaborate where possible and really excited to see uh, the next steps uh, coming out of uh, FDA vis-a-vis -vis digital products. Thanks so much, Jen. You know, digital health is a team sport here at FDA. There's an incredible group of people, not just within the Center of Excellence, but beyond working to make all of this happen. And it's such a pleasure to, to talk with you about it today. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Appreciate it. Appreciate you, Brendan. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you, Jen, for those lovely opening remarks. And Brandon, I absolutely love, as you said, digital health is a team sport at FDA. I would say it's a team sport in this industry if you want to do it successfully. So thank you, and we're grateful that you're able to join. So for next session, I know everyone is excited about panel discussion. Um, we have a panel discussion of which we'll talk about navigating complex landscape of digital health regulations with Marissa Ansari. Um, Marissa Ansari, if I can ask you to please join. Before we do that and jump into panel, I also want to orient individuals and showcase some of these resources. They're available on the Dimes website and our colleagues would be uh, sharing some of the links in the chat very shortly. So if you go to the Dimes website under the access resource under the regulatory signs, you will find a tab on digital health regulatory pathway. In that tab, under identify, we have some of the suite of resources. The first one is the Dimes Rec Path tool. This is a tool that has been developed to help individuals and navigate various um, different pathways just by answering simple questions. So say for example, I am, I'm not a founder, but I'm gonna be founder for just a second. If I'm developing a digital therapeutic solution of which has software-based application and I'm interested in understanding what regulations may apply, and I have a single intended use of treating a patient, say, for example, for COPD. Um, because it's a software-based uh, application, um, I will select one of the software components, and then I will walk through some of the questions around what's my intended use, where it is going to be applicable. And as you answer some of these questions, we have crafted this beautifully that can help you lead to an answer um, of what is most likely your, or what, what most likely the pathway is for your digital health product. So it's very interactive, it's very cool um, and very useful. And I hope you uh, use this as you build your products. And if you're a nerd like me who loves puzzles, um, we have also created and turned down the logic behind this whole tool into a flow chart that walks through a couple of questions that starts with asking those important questions on who the users are, 
intended users are for your product. What, when, where, why? And then as you answer some of these questions, it will help you navigate through various different products. This flowchart is a consolidation of various different regulatory guidances. And at the end, um, if you have a regulatory path or if oversight is needed, you will be able to reach to regulatory path when we have some action-oriented tools that you can use to implement that. Last but not the least, we also have a library of digital health regulations in an air table where we have consolidated and started um, for US regulations. And this library um, in the next couple of months will have international regulations um, and others build upon this. So without further ado, I would love to welcome um, our next panelists for the conversation, um, Asari Kaganoff, Marissa Cruz, um, and then Jen Goldsack at the stage. Fantastic, thanks, Mitt. Um, and everyone's heard enough from me already. So uh, sorry, Marissa, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourselves, but it, what a thrill to be able to uh, share the stage today with you both. You have both been uh, tremendous colleagues of mine, great friends of Dime, and so instrumental um, in driving ahead uh, the field of digital health over the last few years, right? As a team, it's it's uh, the time is passing more quickly than perhaps I was prepared for. So let me kick it to you perhaps first, Sari. Uh, do you wanna go ahead um, and introduce yourself? Then I'll come to Marissa, then we'll dive into our conversation. Sounds great. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Sumit, for hosting me here today. Um, so I'm Sari Kaganoff. I lead the consulting practice at Rock Health. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Rock Health, we are a digital health focused company who have three complementary organizations, a venture fund, a digital health strategy group, and a nonprofit advancing equity centered change. Uh, so our consulting practice where I sit uh, works with enterprise clients and late stage startups on digital health strategy, which sometimes regu regulatory elements are a part of it. And we've uh, had the honor of working with Dime and the other contributors on this effort. And so really excited now to, to see it being launched. Um, and sorry, thank you so much for all of your hard work on this. Marissa, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself too? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be part of the conversation and part of the launch. Um, I think this is really valuable work for the industry as a whole. Um, I'm Marissa Cruz. I'm the chief medical officer for Empatica, which is a company focused on making innovative uh, digital biomarkers to improve clinical outcomes. I oversee the regulatory affairs and clinical science divisions of Empatica, and um, I have spent about seven years or so um, in my career at FDA in various capacities, so um, have enjoyed the ability to, to see this um, evolve over time and to, to see both perspectives. Fantastic. And Marissa, um, I have a few questions for you on that today as you mm -hmm. do look at it from, uh, I want to say both sides of the fence, but that's not right. That's entirely what we're trying to debunk today. <laughs> as you look at it from a, as a government employee and as an industry employee, but we'll come back to that. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, you teed us up really nicely for that first question. So you have sort of an extraordinary breadth of reach into the industry because of you know, the partners that you consult for. Or you did mention this idea of sort of um, you know, regulations come up often as we're doing our business consulting. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, broad brushstrokes, how has the industry changed in recent years in terms of attitudes to the regulatory environment? Um, I'm not going to frame that one too much. I'm really thrilled to hear, but then perhaps uh, you, Marissa, and I can dive into that a little bit once you share your perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing to think about as we start on this question is when you think about digital health and you know the, all that encompasses whether it's digital bioworkers like you work on Marissa or other things um, the whole point of that industry is to be cutting edge it's to be innovating all the time and pushing the envelope all the time we're taking technologies that exist or that don't even exist but potentially were developed for other purposes and saying how can we apply them to healthcare and so by nature we're going to be in a gray zone where we don't really know what the regulatory landscape is, you know, and what needs to be applied. So I think that's the first thing to keep in mind is the reason it's challenging is almost by design. It's, it's because we're operating in this space that makes it sometimes tricky. So I think some of the things that have made it challenging in the past and you know hopefully this initiative will help to to support and, and remove some of those barriers 
is number one, even knowing do you use your, does your product need regulatory approval or not? If so, which pathway should you pursue? Um, you know, how does it fit within the prior types of healthcare or medical device solutions that existed? Obviously, the FDA has been updating regulations, but mostly that's going to come a little bit behind the most cutting edge innovation by nature, because until we know what we need to regulate, <laughs> we can't regulate it. And so I think that keeping that framework in mind and knowing that this is all normal. This is the growing pains of an evolving and innovative industry. But that said, yes, a lot of times it does come up in a business decision of the product that we're developing, where does it fit in the landscape? Does it need to be regulated? Does it not? And also how does that fit with our business model and strategy? And you know, sometimes we can get to this later. Sometimes it's a choice of whether you pursue regulatory approval or not. And so knowing all those components, I think is, is really critical. Um, there's a couple of things you said there that are really important. I think that um, Smith introduced right off the bat some statistics around, you know, what does the developer community sort of know and understand in terms of is my product regulated and if so, how? Um, sort of staggering statistics in, in some respects um, as we look at the answers to those questions. But it's interesting too to couple that with what we've just heard from Brendan, which is you know, we've only really just defined what does come under regulatory oversight. And that's not a criticism to exactly your point, Sari. You know, we're at the cutting end, edge of things. Um, there's there's a sort of interesting piece there, right? Which is, um, and this is something that, uh, where I start boring people with endless sports analogies, which is, if you want to be on the leading edge of things, you have to get a little bit comfortable being uncomfortable. And so what's interesting to me sometimes is observing these really innovative, these really determined organizations tap out a little bit when it comes to regulatory strategy. But, and, and how can we reframe sort of growing pains as opportunity? Um, and so Marissa, I'm gonna loop that back around to you and say, you know, you saw this, from within the agency as you were sort of working hard and doing excellent work to define the space, what should be regulated and how in a fast moving environment, you're now on the other side of things, part of that, you know, industry innovator community. What's changed over the last few years from your perspective, especially trying to contemplate that question from both sides? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, um, I would, I would definitely sort of underscore the points that have already been made. One, about um, the pace at which uh, technology has been evolving. And two, about the breadth of what we are looping into a digital health umbrella, right? Really spanning some of, you know, consumer digital health um, or this direct-to-consumer model all the way through um, some fairly sophisticated models like the ones that Brendan alluded to that would be um, more AI, ML-driven and and uh, open to, to some of the regulatory paradigms that are actively under development uh, by the agency now. So I, I think there's there's a lot of moving parts here, and I think that both the uh, innovator community as well as the regulatory community are trying as, as quickly as possible and as uh, responsibly as possible to adapt uh, to the, those changing kind of definitions of what's in, what's out, and how do we think about risk stratification across the, the spectrum of digital health products. Um, I do think that uh, sticking points on, on both sides have sometimes been in the areas of terminology, of trying to be clear about regulatory constructs while being accessible to innovators, especially on the, the smaller end of the developer community who are less familiar potentially with how to navigate guidance documents, how to interpret them, what they really mean. If you figure out you are regulated, like how, how does that translate into who I need to hire, what my business strategy is, what my timeline for approval might be, et cetera. So I think um, work like this that tries to demystify some of the terminology and, uh, and bring clarity into um, the discussion on, on both sides is really helpful. Um, Marissa, I think the focus on language is really important, and there are some very technical terms um, in the regulations, and we should expect that. It's, it's mm -hmm. true in all, you know, regulations across all industries, and again, instead of sort of fighting, this is an opportunity for organizations to differentiate themselves, to be more successful by taking the time to understand what they mean and how they can truly be opportunities instead of burdens. Um, sorry, is 
there's been a really interesting evolution in the marketplace as well as you know a rapid evolution in the breadth and nature of the products that we are thinking will bring value in the healthcare environment a lot of companies that were early stage startups right five years ago are now reasonably mature how has that maturity that experience they have um, positioned them to think a little bit differently, perhaps, around regulatory strategy, because we mustn't be unaware of the changing marketplace as well as the changing product types. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think one thing we've seen along the lines here is, you know, it's challenging when a lot of these companies are venture backed. VCs, especially those with experience in tech, are looking for relatively rapid returns and rapid go to market this you know it's yes there are some biotech investors invest, investing in digital health and maybe they are more used to this and have a different expectation but the digital health investors and the technology investors are sort of looking for this opportunity in addition as a tech company with a product that's often consumer facing or user facing whether that's a patient or a provider you do want to get rapid feedback on your product so what i think we've seen many companies do is say, you know what, I'm going to start off with a product that may not be under regulatory guidance and approval, but maybe it doesn't actually do all the things that I hope and wish and dream that one day it will do, right? And so being able to say, look, I'm going to stay within the guidelines of claims that I can make without regulatory oversight for that first iteration, get some of that experience under my belt, get some revenue under my belt. And now that I'm a little bit more established, I can now pursue the um, sort of more regulatory land, approved landscape. So you do see a number of companies going that route where they say, let's get a product in market first and then level up on the capabilities of that product along with the regulatory landscape. On the other hand, there's some companies that have just said, you know what, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm going to take the approach of making sure the people supporting me know that this will take a long time and, and get started with that approval up front. So we do see different pathways that people are choosing. <laughs> that was an unintended pun with the word pathways, but different approaches that people are, are choosing uh, to get to that point. But I think now that we have a generation of companies that are more established, have been around for longer, I think those companies will be able to focus more on the regulatory approved areas, as well as also um, those who've done it once. You know, those who've made it through can now bring other products or other features through in a hopefully um, more streamlined way as well. Um, sorry, you gave some really excellent and tangible examples there. Uh, and I'm going to continue to hammer a theme, which is of how a deep understanding of what the regulatory pathways are, how a claim you make rolls up to the product type and the pathway. And also don't apologize for using the term. It's not by accident we picked it. Um, but um, you can actually be really thoughtful around what your product and portfolio strategy looks like. And you can communicate with confidence to your investors and potentially future investors um, if that's the pathway that you find yourself on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think those examples are incredibly useful. Marissa, and once again, maybe I'll just add one other thought. You know, you talked about knowing your own pathway and being able to communicate the regulations. I would encourage everyone in the ecosystem, if you are not a developer or an innovator, get famil become familiar with the terminology. Be understand at least the basics of what does it mean to be under each status, because there are people who will use terms, and if you don't know what they mean, you won't have your spidey sense of, of what should I be looking for, right? So if somebody says, oh, this thing was FDA cleared, well, what do they mean? Do they mean it was approved? Do they mean it was exempt? What do they mean, right? And so understanding which words mean what will help you be a more discerning user or buyer or whatever the case is. So even if you're not the innovator choosing the pathway, a, a sort of baseline understanding for everyone in the ecosystem, I think is an important feature. Um, I'm just going to underscore that for a second. And then Marissa, I'm going to give you a moment because I, my suspicion is you have some of the same feelings on this that <laughs> I do, but it's not just, you know, how could I potentially avoid regulations, but I've certainly seen earlier stage companies and their regulatory strategy is, 
gosh, in a period of time, we're going to have to go out and raise our Series B. Well, sorry, to your point, getting a clearance for anything in our product portfolio doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We're going to do it just to say we did in our next pitch deck, which mm -hmm. also is not using regulatory strategy to the best. You can also think about the fact that you're enrolling patients in those trials. What's your ethical obligation if that's, you know, the flex that you decide to have in that moment? Having a deep understanding of the value on both sides is so important. Marissa, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would I would echo many of those sentiments. Um, I think it's incredibly important, as Sari said, for the full ecosystem to get a comfort level with understanding regulatory terminology, understanding different uh, regulatory statuses and their implications for use, right? And so that spans from innovators themselves to potentially these investors, people who'd be evaluating them um, as, as collaborators and partners. And then also very importantly to patients and clinicians and healthcare systems um, who are often the end users of these technologies and understanding whether or not the product that I am considering incorporating into clinical care is regulated and whether that whether that innovator made a good decision about whether or not it should be regulated. Again, you get to, there is some, some flexibility in the kinds of claims that you make and the kinds of pathways that you might pursue, but that has real implications on how much um, a clinician might rely on a particular technology to steer clinical decision-making and how a patient might understand the use of that technology in their care. So I think, you know, drawing as, as wide a, a umbrella as possible over what we determine what we call stakeholders is important to make sure that everyone uh, who is involved in creating, using, interpreting the outputs of these technologies is as familiar as possible uh, with the with the constructs is is incredibly important. Um, fantastic. And I like how you're both pushing us to think about this not just as a burden that sits on the shoulders of our developer sort of colleagues, but it's actually something that everyone who's participating in this ecosystem needs to understand. And I think if we take that back to what Brendan was saying, the purpose of this is to build trustworthy products, right? They need to be safe and effective. They need to be adopted. Um, being thoughtful about the regulatory opportunities that are available to you is gonna help you do that. Um, Marissa, I wonder if I can um, ask you a question. You sit at a sort of high growth organization You've had some real wins in terms of your own regulatory strategy. Are you comfortable sharing a little bit with us um, how you've helped develop a culture internally where folks are really open to embracing the hard work sometimes that goes into capturing the evidence, the protracted timelines, you know, compared to, sorry, what you were saying, you know, let's just get it to market as quickly as we can, like another tech widget. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Any tips and tricks you have for people vis-a-vis a cultural embrace of all of this. Yeah, that's a that's a question that I uh, grapple with often. Um, I do, you know, I'm somewhat uh, biased from my my current perspective. I do think it's important to have clinicians, patient voices in, you know, whether or not they're direct employees at a company, but to, to really understand who would be the end users of this product and get those voices represented very early in product development, right? I think that that helps a company to unify around the importance of responsibly delivering technologies that really actually impact clinical outcomes. And so when, when that's a shared responsibility, I think there's often a much higher willingness to uh, accept some of the uh, additional requirements that come with moving down a regulated pathway. Um, we talk a lot at Empatica, and I've talked a lot in previous companies about this culture of quality, that once you go down this regulated pathway, there is you know, aspects of quality management that are additional beyond what would be uh, typical for a tech company that's outside of a health space. And so I think, um, again, it, it is a matter of persistently um, educating people on what it is to be, to have gone down this, why there's benefit in a, in differentiating yourself potentially from, from competitors who might've picked a, le a less regulated space where there is return on investment for going down this pathway. And then to make sure that, that there is a culture of quality from the various highest levels that management is routinely, um, speaking about the importance of quality as a demarcator of the the product that you're that you're building and again connecting it to that that end user and the, the real mission statement of why we're building these technologies. 
Um, Marissa, those are fantastic insights, you know, quality and a focus on the mission, right, which for us as an industry is to take get better care of the patients we're all here to serve. Organizations like yours and all of the project participants, there's a superpower in-house to actually build these things. Like, let's build them right. Let's embrace those regulatory strategies. Let's bring them to the right market for as many people possible. Sorry, similar question for you as you think about working with sort of the leading innovators um, in the field through your practice. Um, what are some of the discussions that you have that are most effective in terms of moments in time? Marissa talked about sort of having these conversations sooner rather than later. Could you build on that a little bit? What's the right time for organizations to start thinking about regulatory strategy? I mean, I'd say from the beginning, right? I think uh, immediately when you're starting to think about your product and you're dreaming what that's going to be, as you're fleshing out your product concept, that's the time in parallel to think through your regulatory strategy. One thing I would flag, though, is that your commercial strategy will be very closely tied to whatever your regulatory strategy is, both in terms of who you sell to, what you say to them, how you get reimbursed by them, but also timing, right? If you're going to have something go through regulatory approval, well, when are you going to launch that sales force? When are you going to sign those contracts? Is it going to be before your approval is complete? When you think it's going to be, can you build that flexibility in? Are you going to wait? How are you going to build out that whole commercial element of your business? Um, so it's both the commercial strategy very early on, but also the commercial operation and execution. Um, I think it's all really part and parcel of a strategy of any digital health company that's at least touching something that could be regulated. It's an important discussion to have, even if you choose to say, or if you learn that, you know what, this is not something I don't need to be regulated, fine. But it is part of the strategy that you need to figure out very early on and throughout the life cycle. Fantastic, which rounds us out nicely with an, another sort of ring of the bell. Regulatory strategy is critical to good business strategy. Sorry, Marissa, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for all of your hard work and expertise in driving this project forward. And thank you for all you do, both in partnership with Dive and the extraordinary work you do leading the field. Appreciate you both. Appreciate you being here today. And Smith will yield the mic back to you. I love it. I have a chicken scratch of things I can dive deep into, but this has been a terrific conversation. And thank you, Marissa, sorry, Jen, for a fantastic panel. Moving along with the fantasticness, I don't know if that's the term, but moving along with the awesomeness, um, we will have next panel uh, who will be discussing the same concepts um, that we just started to talk about is optimizing regulatory strategy as it connects to the good business strategy. So if I can ask Ryan Hoshi and Nikki Batista to come on stage. And uh, as they're coming on stage, I am gonna share some of the resources uh, that we have built as a part of what can help you design some of your strategic uh, parameters as a part of your digital health product, if you're building it or if you're implementing it and deploying it out of the market. So in the strategy uh, pool, we have a really nice uh, guide that goes through a quick example on an illustrative example of what they have done over the last couple of years, how they have used this regulatory path. What are some of the components, core components of building the regulatory strategy? What are some of the components of, of implementing it? But one of the first things of, as you design or think about your regulatory strategies, thinking about what role do you play? Are you the informer of the strategy or are you the decision maker? Or are you the implementer where a pathway has been identified of, uh, for the product and you implement it, which is critical. We also have some really strong uh, case examples of two innovative products, Tide Pools uh, Loop, which is one of the first automated insulin dosing application uh, that recently received perhaps in Can we have shown um, some strategy behind what were some of their thought process? What were the factors that they had considered when they were going through this regulatory path? Along that line, uh, if you remember, Brendan in the keynote mentioned about the pre determined change control plan. Um, we have an organization's journey, Caption Health's journey, which was one of the first products authorized in their FDA's pre determined change control plan by a DNOVA pathway uh, with the caption guidance. We have shared some information some of their strategy and they were very kind enough to share their journey with us. The second part is a product development classification toolkit. And this toolkit has various resources from overview, how FDA regulates to also, as Marissa had mentioned around, you need to identify risk assessments, 
uh, as a part during design, during development, during post-market? And how do you identify your product class and product type? We have a full five-step approach um, that walks you through some of the examples, a real-world example on how to comb through, search through the FDA databases, comb through the CFR Title 21, and how do you identify the right product class? There are other uh, information about intended use, how to craft them, some examples for those. There's a decision map um, along with the same five-step process that you can use. And last but not the least, pathways toolkit. So once you use the tool or the flow chart that was shown before, you just don't wanna tell you that you are likely on a 510K pathway. We have created resources for each pathway, which includes an at a glance, preparation guide, checklist, frequently asked questions. So everything that you need uh, to implement this in real life so that uh, we are not just telling about it, we are showing you how to do it. Without further ado, Let's welcome uh, Ryan Hoshi and Nikki for uh, the conversation and panel. And Ryan and Nikki have been amazing uh, colleagues, two individuals I absolutely adore who started their journeys in federal agency and have now taken two really strong paths and two different stakeholders of an early stage startup and from the big pharma. So I'm gonna stop talking. Why don't you introduce yourself and Nikki and Ryan? Sure, I can go first. Hi, everyone. Nikki Batista. I'm the Senior Director of the Digital Health Program at MICRA. We are a clinical research organization and integrated advisory firm, and our digital health program is designed to help usher clients through the various stakeholders, and I lead the regulatory team here. Excited for the conversation. Great. Um, thanks so much, Smith. Hi, my name is Ryan Hoshi, and I'm Director of Regulatory Policy and Intelligence at AbbVie and I'm the global policy topic lead for medical devices and digital health, both very exciting and dynamic topics. Um, and as you mentioned, I had the pleasure of working with Nikki while I was at FDA, um, but also another um, AbbVie colleague of mine, Katie Chowdhury, a shout out to her. Uh, we also worked at FDA and now contributed um, as part of this working group through DIME. And so I think we've all come really full circle on this project. Um, trying to bring our perspectives from both FDA and industry. I love it. And we are very grateful for a strong team we had to develop, co-develop these resources. So thank you. I want to start with something that Sari mentioned, you know, optimizing regulatory strategy and connecting to commercial. You know, it feels like this grandiose word. There are so many components to it. What is step zero? Where can someone start as they are thinking about building their regulatory strategy? Yeah, I'll start first. Um, well, I think the, the question is, it, it can be really overwhelming to people, especially for those who are um, unfamiliar with regulated products. And I think that's the approach we, we tried to take with the project, working with DIME on developing the regulatory decision map and the tools, is that people often don't know where to start. Um, and really trying to figure out how your product is regulated is a good starting point. Um, there's important distinctions on, you know, what defines a regulated medical device. Um, and in the digital health space, digital health technologies are so diverse. And so just because something incorporates a digital health technology may or may not mean that it could be considered a regulated product and subject to certain FDA regulations. And so I think during our group discussions, we had different perspectives from vendors, from innovators, manufacturers, consultants, and FDA in this space. And we were all asking, you know, really challenging questions as we develop the decision tree. Um, and so I think it's really important to consider, you know, where do you fall um, in this spectrum of digital health products, which may or may not be considered a medical device? And I, I can I can build on that a little bit. I think it, one of the common themes within our working group was an acknowledgement in a slight variation between the language industry and innovators use compared to regulators. And it's okay. And, and as long as we understand the analogies and how to effectively communicate, I think another piece uh, in doing and implementing that concept is. We'll, we'll talk about navigating regulatory paradigms, but for someone who doesn't even know what a paradigm might be or a pathway might be, simple breakthrough questions, the icebreaker questions that the tool asks 
What is your device doing? Who are your users? Um, and I would encourage people to map out who are your potential competitors. And then we can get into the regulatory weeds where what are the potential regulations that could apply to your product? But asking those really basic questions that you probably have written in a pitch deck, just what is your product? And then we can start formulating this concept of an indication tree statement that is a really good launching point for regulatory strategy. I love that. Both the nuggets on in terms of the five W's, who, why, when, how, what, um, will start getting started. And I think the first question, Ryan, as you mentioned, is around, you know, um, are you on the line of having the regulatory oversight versus not like skating the line and understanding is like the first critical step. I want to touch base and Nikki, you have a lot of experience with uh, advising on early stage startup. You know, we talk about this concept of cost of regulatory uncertainty um, and mm -hmm. the implications it may have to, you know, the resources there, uh, the teams that they hire to the financial cost on the long term. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Could you share some thoughts on what are some of those costs of regulatory uncertainty beyond cash? Yeah, I think it's important to not only think about you as an innovator, you as a company trying to navigate FDA, but think about FDA almost as a collaborator and a potential cost um, or being affected by this cost of uncertainty. So if we think about uh, intangibles, um, it's things like uh, strain in communication uh, or lack of communication. Or I know personally as a former reviewer, sometimes you feel like you just don't have the full picture because sponsors might be hesitant to share information with you. Um, and on the flip side, it's important for sponsors and companies to think about what, what is important information for FDA to know. And so the, the tangibles are the delayed timelines, the cost, you know, de delay to product launch. But I think it's those intangibles that we can really think about how to effectively navigate the agency and do it right the first time. And the do it, it is your formal marketing application. And we can inform that by engaging with the agency through the available paradigms like, or pathways rather, like a pre-submission, just like a product, your regulatory strategy gets iterated, right? We have an evolving regulatory landscape. Innovation is passing through the agency all the time. And the agency is what we call current thinking is constantly evolving based off of what they learn from industry, the devices that they're reviewing, the new novel regulatory questions that they have to ask, but they look to industry to help inform on how to answer those. So I, I think through communication, we can find resolution in this uncertainty and have transparency for companies, for FDA and a company stakeholders like VC firms or whoever might need that small uh, short win like Sari mentioned in the prior panel. I love that. Um, Ryan, I wanna to come to you next uh, thinking about, you know, we start with the step zero. Um, we talk about, you know, identifying, navigating once uh, someone understands um, those early lexicons and navigation. There are so many components to it in terms of where they market, um, what they do with the product that actually helps them build a good, robust strategy. Could you walk us through some of the components that we have discussed, what you see um, as you build some of the products internally um, or in the field? Yeah, um, well, I think, you know, coming from a global company and in internal conversations, we always think about, um, you know, go to market strategy and which jurisdictions to go to first. And um, I wanna emphasize that the, these tools and resources are just for the US market, FDA. And FDA has done such a great job creating so much guidance and forward thinking policies in this space. But, you know, in developing a global strategy, there's a lot of markets that have a lot of regulatory uncertainty. Um, uh, the concept of just a medical device regulatory framework is new for a lot of um, emerging health authorities, um, let alone having um, guidance and regulations for software as a medical device or digital health technologies. Um, and so um, I really hope that this sparks a conversation, um, trying to get other stakeholders involved, talking about the global challenges 
with these products because we want these products not just for American patients, but for but for global patients. Um, and so developing a global regulatory strategy, especially in this digital health space, it's very challenging trying to understand the landscape. I really love what you mentioned, Ryan, in terms of, you know, starting with the market. Um, our resources are specifically geared towards as individuals are demystifying or trying to bring the product in the U.S. market, but there are multiple opportunities. And um, actually, the follow on some of the work that Dime would be doing um, after this uh, is on the international uh, landscape around some of the harmonization, how they do it. So more information we'll share at the end of the session. But Nikki, I want to come next to you in terms of I can ask you questions around like change control plans and software modifications, but like you have advised a lot of early state startups and innovators. And then Ryan, you have been in this field um, advising your internal teams at Abby and others. What advice do you have for individuals who feel stuck on where to start? You know, this is a lot of information. I don't know where to start, what to do. How do you help? Sure. So I think the the way this panel described the first word is optimize. So we're optimizing strategy. And I think optimal means different things for different people. Um, and depending on what your technology is, who your stakeholders are, what you're trying to accomplish as a business, what, what patients are you trying to reach, really determines what that optimal strategy is. So when we think about, uh, I know Sari had suggested in the last panel, thinking about early wins, which is a common strategy that some people think. And I know there was a, a question in the Q&A about what are the repercussions or risks related to launching with a non-regulated product? And these are all considerations we have to think about because FDA from a market uh, authorization standpoint isn't your only um, stakeholder. We have to think about what are the operational features and, and uh, paradigms you have to have in place to produce a high quality product? And when, at what point do you start to introduce design controls? When does your company have the capacity to implement a quality management system? You know, we like to do it in a phased approach because as you mentioned, we work with a lot of smaller companies that don't have um, global teams or well-seasoned teams. So um, outsourcing and thinking resourcefully and thriftfully is, thing, is important. So it's all about thinking about what's the optimal strategy for you, understanding when it makes most sense for your company and the resources you have to enter the regulated space, um, but knowing what that means. When do you, when do you have to stand up the, the infrastructure around the concept of creating a device um, so that when you do it, you do it the right way and you do it uh, according to the applicable regulations. And um... To add to what Nikki uh, mentioned, um, I think a lot of people are risk averse, um, especially those that are unfamiliar with a regulated product or um, just medical device regulations in general. And so I think there's sometimes a tendency where if you're developing a digital health tool or a product and you're sitting on the fence, um, where on one side it's you know, it's, it sits in the medical device bucket and the other side, it sits into the, the non-regulated bucket. I think for a lot of people, they tend to avoid as much as possible any type of feature, indication, um, user, patient population that would kick it into a medical device bucket. Uh, just because there's, they're so afraid of the regulatory burden, um, the regulatory risk and the uncertainties involved in that. But um, I think hopefully with these tools and the conversations I've been having with other people internally and externally is that, um, you know, there's also an opportunity cost if you don't take risks in really trying to develop a product that has meaningful impact to patients. Um, and so for some people who just want to avoid as much as possible the regulated space, I think you're missing out on a lot of opportunity. I love that. And this is going to be the next tie through through the next panel on the opportunity cost and how we discuss. Nikki, Ryan, thank you so much for joining today. It has been excellent to hear not only about how to get started, but like what are some of those other considerations and um, components that they need to think about as they build their regulatory strategy. And there are a lot of resources for individuals who would like to jump in. But um, if you can 
stickers with us for the Q&A session after our final panel that would be great. But thank you for your leadership, for your time today, and for all your insights that you shared as a part of the project. All right, thank you. Beautiful. Well, one another amazing panel leads to the last one, uh, last but the mighty one, which is one of the most important one. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen um, and also welcome Steve Berman and Megan Doyle to join us um, for panel three as we discuss various kinds of interactions with agencies on building good digital health products. Before I do that, I wanna take a few seconds to show you some of the resources we have built as a part um, that will essentially help you to interact with regulators early and often. So it doesn't feel like another scary thing uh, to do. And hopefully these resources will um, be impactful. The first we start with some of the value of digital health regulations where we share uh, the reasons behind some illustrative examples on companies who have done it, how they have done it, why they have done it and what outcomes they have received. Um, along with that, we have an really impressive regulatory engagement map that we try to map out all different kinds of formal and informal channels that are available for innovators to communicate with FDA based on the products that they are building. Um, and also an engagement pathways guide, which goes through every single detail from who do I email? What kind of questions do I ask? Uh, what kind of outcomes would I get? things like that. Um, we have some checklist on PAC 13G, pre-submission checklist that um, Nikki just mentioned that uh, any, any individuals can use. And also best practices. You know, it may sound trivial, but what are those do's and don'ts and why does it matter? So let me go ahead and welcome our next speakers, uh, Steve Berman and Ethan Doyle. Um, would you like to do a quick introduction and tell us who you are? Very happy to. My name is Steve Berman. I'm a director of uh, regulatory affairs, it, translational regulatory affairs at AstraZeneca, supporting the oncology therapeutic area. And what that means is that uh, my role is to help leverage novel technologies, novel techniques to uh, get safe and effective therapies to patients quickly. Um, and certainly, digital health technologies have the ability to do that. And so it's been great to work on this project, to work with my colleagues here uh, to help uh, demystify how to do that. Megan? Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, so I'm Megan Doyle. Um, I'm with Amgen, where I'm a director of uh, regulatory and R&D policy. I'm a device lawyer by training. I spent a number of years advising device and digital health companies on submissions to the FDA and how to get their products approved and post-market compliance, and then joined Amgen in our law department, where I advised a lot of our teams that were developing new products that combined devices and drugs and digital health, connected combination products, and then also standalone digital health products. And now I'm our global policy lead for digital health diagnostics and oncology. So get to work in the regulatory policy space about thinking about what the law should be and not just what the law is. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that, what the law should be and how do we use it. Um, one of the things I wanna start with this panel, um, is Ryan Hoshi mentioned in the last panel about opportunity costs. And I think for one of the things that we have still seen uh, hesitation when it comes to approaching regulatory space for digital health products, uh, there's a gap in understanding the value of the regulations. You are experts, you have seen, you have shared with some of your colleagues. How do you see, what are some of the value that you perceive as novel products are being built in industry? Do you want to go first, Steve, or I can't? I'm happy to. Sure, I'll, I'll go. I'll go first here. Thank you. Um, so I see uh, regulatory affairs strategy not as a cost center, but as a value driver, um, if and when it's done thoughtfully, um, because the the outcomes that come from a thoughtful regulatory strategy can really uh, ultimately help patients and help the producers of those those uh, digital therapies. So thinking about what claims that you want to make. What are the direct benefits to the end users? Thinking about those early, engaging with the regulators early can really add value in a way that if you're unfamiliar with the space and you think of regulatory compliance as just costs, you might miss that opportunity. Yeah, and just building on that, you know, I think in my experience, interacting with FDA just allows sponsors, both clinical trial sponsors and then manufacturers of products 
to just get really much needed feedback on everything from potential claims, as Steve mentioned, for a digital health product, and also the evidence that needs to be generated to support those claims, um, clinical study design, evidence needed to use a digital health technology or DHT in a drug clinical study. Also, just as we've talked about all, all, all of this webinar, the regulatory status of a product and the regulatory pathway for a product. And again, what would be the evidence typically expected to support an application via that regulatory pathway? So these interactions can really be invaluable in developing your product strategy, your timelines, your budget, because once you understand the expectations, you can make informed decisions about which claims you want to pursue, which functions for your software, or your digital health product, which study designs. And, and just one additional point that um, I think it's important to think about, especially if you are developing a new product, it really allows you as the sponsor or the manufacturer to fully explain to FDA the intent of the program and the rationale for your product under development. And this can help ensure that all the parties are on the same page. So if you do have to submit a marketing application, your product review and the questions can focus on the substantive issues and you're not wasting time with clarifying questions about what is the product and what does it do? You know, it just allows you to sort of explain your product to the FDA and help them understand it. I love that. I have, a, I have some chicken scratch here. Oh. Steve, I really loved how you said like if and when done thoughtfully, um, because that's one of the key components. It's like, do not just show up on the doors of FDA is like, hey, I'm building a product. Is it regulated or not? But more so having some of those asking key questions and stuff. And in the best practice guidance, we, we share some of those. Would you like to give voice to you based on your experience? What are some things that innovators needs to think about and some things they should not do? Sure. So I think one common misconception is that um, the favorite word of the regulator is no. Re regulators uh, don't have the role of uh, restricting uh, what makes it to market. The, the staff who make up the, the FDA, they're really interested in promoting and protecting the public health, which means they want to see high quality innovative products on the market as quickly as possible. Um, but in order for them to be effective in that mission, it's important to provide them with all of the information that they need in the way that they're expecting to see it uh, when you have those interactions with them. Um, so that means being able to describe what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do uh, how you're trying to do it um, in ways that they're familiar with understanding. And so that's where tools like those that are being debuted today can be really helpful. Yeah, I agree with everything that Steve just said. And I think it's important to point out that's sort of another potential benefit of meeting with the agency. You may find out that they agree with your assessment about the product's regulatory strategy or, or regulatory status or your evidence generation plan, which can streamline and direct your next steps. And if you find out that they disagree, better to know that earlier than later. Um, but I just couldn't underscore enough what Steve said in terms of you know, regulators not necessarily being the no man. You know, in my experience, regulators globally that I've worked with are very receptive to well-reasoned science-based arguments, you know? And I do think if you make your case well and you, you support it with details about the, your knowledge of the product and your assessment of the regulations, you can have a really robust conversation and find that they're a lot more flexible and receptive than you may think. Megan, I really like that because um, the fact one of the things that was discussed early on, and we see this, is FDA CDRH uh, division, specifically Digital Health Center of Excellence, is such open and collaborative, and they are trying to have public-private partnerships, be partner with on future projects, and making sure that industry not just have the guidances, but can also ask questions uh, to the agencies, and it's a bi-directional street. You know, and they have also created a lot of channel pathways to have some of these conversations um, and discussions in a formal and informal way that we map in some of the resources. Um, could you share some of informal and formal resources based on a product? And I know Steve, uh, Megan, who had a background in different divisions outside CDRH as well, um, when sometimes it could be applicable. Share some of the thoughts and those pathways. Yeah, I'm happy to start, Steve, if you want, and then would love to have your input on the CEDAR side from your experience. You know, I can 
touched some of that because I've interacted with both centers. But you know, there's a number of ways to engage with the agency across all three centers on digital health products and topics. You know, and as you mentioned, uh, Smith, these go from less formal interactions like the um, Device Center's Digital Health Center of Excellence Digital Health Inbox, which allows for those quick responses to certain questions. And interestingly and excitingly, uh, today FDA just added a new inbox for questions about use of digital health technologies in drug development, which is fantastic. But it ranges from those really informal interactions to more formal interactions, such as pre-sub meetings that were mentioned earlier with CDRH on device questions, and then also milestone meetings with CEDAR and CBER for drug and biologic related questions. And, you know, in terms of the opportunities these kinds of engagements provide, and we kind of go into this in the resources, but on the device side, as Nikki mentioned, you know, pre-sub meetings are an opportunity to discuss a variety of topics relating to how to develop a medical device. And it can be everything from study designs to regulatory pathway, potential predicates. And so these are just a really great way to get feedback from the agency to guide your product development and avoid surprises in the review of, of your marketing application or your 510k notice. And at least in my experience, FDA is always advised on the device side that companies do a pre-sub if they're going to submit a marketing application. Um, and then of course on the CEDAR CBER side, which um, Steve I know has a ton of experience with and can speak to, but you can also interact with FDA on the use of these tools in drug development via those milestone meetings I mentioned, which are at certain points in the drug development process, or type C meetings, which can be um, to discuss various topics related to a drug development program outside of those formal milestones. Um, and FDA has even added a new meeting type called the type D meeting, um, which allows drug and biologic sponsors to discuss a discrete topic with the agency. Um, and it could be potentially used to discuss these digital health related issues as they pertain to a drug development program and get you know, feedback in a meeting dedicated to that topic. So there's a lot of different ways. And then we even have in the Dine resources um, called out various ways to engage on combination products with the agency. So there's various ways to get the answer to your question of whether your product is a combination product. And if so, which is the lead center? How would it be regulated? And other questions like, that are just specific and unique to that combination product space. So there's a variety of opportunities and they all lend different types of feedback based on the queries that you have. Well, you didn't leave me much there because that was such a <laughs> comprehensive answer, but oh. I, I will just tie it back to our, our earlier conversation about uh, cost versus value. And I think you, you get the most value um, from engaging with the right part of the regulatory body early. Um, if you wait to think about your regulatory strategy when it's time to do a submission, whether that's um, a 510k or uh, a de novo for a device, or whether it's use of uh, a DHT in a clinical trial at a, you know, for a phase three study, that's probably too late. Um, it doesn't help the regula regulators, and it certainly doesn't help you as the developer. So looking at the tools that, that Dime is rolling out today about how to engage early, how to engage the right people early, I think really benefits everyone involved. Love that, it's our triangle of engage early, engage often and, and be transparent. Um, because if you can do that, I think you can successfully uh, navigate, navigate, you can successfully discuss uh, some of the potentials. I have a lot of questions to dive in, but I also wanna be respectful. I know there are a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I, be, if we can take a few moments to invite all the speakers on this stage, including Ryan, Nikki, uh, Marissa, Sari, Jen, um, we would love to discuss some of the questions. If anyone has questions, uh, please raise their hand. I see Josh Lee has a question raised. Um, if we can give him an opportunity. That would be lovely. Hi, folks. This is uh, Josh Lee from SSI. Um, thanks for putting this together. Thanks, Jen and Dime team. This is just phenomenal. A lot of amazing resources that I'm already super excited to use, uh, and I definitely will be using immediately after this call. <laughs> um, my question is around um, kind of for organizations, whether that's a, a, a digital health tech company um, that might be looking for, we're actually a little bit further along the route where we feel like we have a good idea of whether it's going to be a 510k de novo 
or potentially also a CE mark, right? Like there are elements from a predicate perspective that we need to get a sense of, but we're doing cost modeling right now. And we're trying to get a sense of like in the long term, you know, we're thinking about later raises as well. How should we think about uh, estimating costs? And, and I think in my in the chat, I, I listed a few categories that we're looking at. Things like, okay, yes, there's the, the submission work and the package creation work and the prep meetings. Then there might be the scientific evidence generation for certain you know, pathways. Um, and you know whether that's a trial or whatever. And then of course the QMS side, which could be large or could be fit for purpose. Can we just talk a little bit about estimating uh, costs, how you guys think about that approach, how long it's, you know, what it's been for you guys, and then also any other things that are I didn't mention that we should be thinking about? That's, uh, that's the question. Sorry if it's long-winded and multi-part. Please jump in. Who'd I stumped the first, <laughs> the first question's a stumper. Well done. <laughs> um, I'm happy to give a few thoughts and then I'm sure others have um, perspectives to share as well. I, I think you, you've hit uh, a number of the, the biggest of the categories, right? So I think that, that that's a, a logical structure to start thinking about costs. Um, regulatory submissions and prep work is actually probably the most straightforward, um, you know, circumscribed cost category in that there are uh, clear, you know, user fee associated uh, fees related to a particular regulatory submission pathway. Um, there's also clear uh, user fee negotiated timelines for uh, when the review is likely to happen, though there's obviously some flexibility in interactive review times that um, can, can, can lengthen that total process. Um, but the the cost of actually preparing the documents, submitting the documents, and undergoing the review, I think, are, are more or less known costs. I think you get into QMS setup, as you said, can be fit for a purpose and can be um, a relatively low cost effort depending on the intended use of your device in terms of actually just setting up an eQMS platform, for example. The work that's, that needs to be done to train folks and to make sure that it's executed appropriately obviously goes well beyond uh, just SOP generation itself, but um, I think is probably sort of the next level of complexity. I think the clinical evidence, though, is where there's there's a lot of variability in cost structure and timeline implications, right? And so you have to think through the world of, you know, sort of algorithm verification, if that's what you're working on, bench testing, if that's applicable, and then prospective clinical trials, depending on your sample size number, can can wildly swing your the total cost of uh, of a project. So I, I think that's where I would uh, take advantage of some of these opportunities for interaction that uh, the panelists have spoken about um, throughout this presentation and say, you know, this is what I'm thinking is an adequate clinical evidence generation plan. Do you agree, FDA? How can we figure out what's the right level of clinical evidence? What's the right sample size? What's the right timeline for this particular project? And, and those pathways, I think, help you to constrain um, as much as possible some of the variables. I'll just add one quick or two quick comments. One, think about what uh, what costs are you going to outsource? What and what resources do you have internally that can cover these? I think that's an important element to thinking about budgeting. Um, and then start talking to those vendors where you're gonna start outsourcing. They, they will have to give you um, price points to, to think about that could be inputs to your budget. And then lastly, to add to your list, and this, I talk to every client ever about this, cybersecurity and usability engineering. Add it to every list, um, the, the regulatory landscape, FDA is not your final stakeholder on this matter, but it's shifting. And it's important for downstream stakeholders, your users, and for incorporating your products into healthcare systems. So. And I just wanted to add one thing, and of course, not here to provide legal advice, not providing legal advice, but I just think that we often talk about the cost upfront of development, and we don't think about the cost of non-compliance and having you know, worked with companies that have had to respond to warning letters and untitled letters, that's not an insignificant cost um, or time either. So it's just something to make sure you know you think about that there are costs to non-compliance as well.
Any additional thoughts before we round us out for some call to action? Fantastic. Well, for closing remarks, I would like to welcome uh, Jen Golsek. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know this has been a fantastic panel and it has been great working with every single member on, on the panel today. But Jen, please uh, close us out with your thoughts. Um, I just want to thank everyone who joined us today. Fantastic discussion. Uh, thank you attendees for being curious about how we can use these new tools, how you can start deploying them today to really improve not only your regulatory strategy, but as we've discussed, your business strategy. And of course, the way the work you are doing um, will improve the lives of as many patients as possible. So just really appreciate everyone on the line enormous gratitude on behalf of Dime to every single member of the project team. Um, when we talk about this being a team sport, this was a, a, a tr you know, a, a true A team. Um, it was also a big team. And I think that reminds us um, of the approach we need to take to this work. It's collaborative. Nikki, you mentioned vendors. Every single one of you on the screen right now mentioned a different colleague within your organization um, that we need to be working with. And then, of course, FDA are our teammates, too. Um, so just thank you everyone who contributed to this. Um, thank you everyone on the line. Um, those resources are now available and open access. Um, and our next project will be um, the, reg the Regulatory Pathways Project addressing international markets. So if this piques your interest, if you want to be part of an exceptional team like this, there's an opportunity for you to get involved today too. So with that, thank you, Smith. Um, thank you everyone on the line um, and wish you all a tremendous rest of the day.